I'm Ronyo. I'm Duran. And this is the Ronyo and Duran podcast show. In today's episode of the Ronyo and Duran podcast show, we're going to be exploring deserialization a little further. So we're working again with our super vulnerable Java application, which you may remember we've built based on a large number of vulnerabilities that we have seen over the past 20 plus years. The vast majority of these vulnerabilities are ones that you will not see displayed the way we have them very frequently. And we're actually going to start with a seemingly complicated, but truly simple example to begin with. Previously, you might remember we did deserialization attacks, and I had mentioned that you can use these deserialization attacks to actually create sessions and perform session hijacking. So just to give you a real quick idea of how this is going to work, I want to actually walk you through some of the code. So we see here we've got authenticate files and projects. You'll notice all of them are using our base stack. Now the base stack is important. It sits right here. We see we have JSON error interceptor, session interceptor, parameter sanitizer interceptor, JSON, default stack, rest interceptor, cookie writer interceptor, session writer interceptor, and then the finalizer. Now, previously we didn't have a means to authenticate, but you can see we, uh, we now have that authenticate action and we have code tied to this sitting right in here. Now, struts told us that the authenticate action is going to call to this particular method Looking at this, we see that authenticate checks to see if a user is authenticated. And then if that fails, it tries to authenticate via the local database. So real quickly, is user authenticated performs very basic checks. It checks to see if session is empty. If session is empty, then it throws an exception, an authentication exception, saying that the session is in fact empty. The next thing that it does is it checks to see if that session map contains a user ID. And you'll notice inside the session map, what we're grabbing is this auth user ID. If both of those checks pass, then the assumption is that the user is in fact authenticated. Now you might wonder where this session data is being pulled from. And the answer is actually found rather abruptly inside of our stack. So you notice we have JSON error interceptor. The assumption can be, and we can look, but the assumption can be that this interceptor is designed to wrap everything so that it will handle any exceptions and then throw them in a manner that is commensurate with JSON. So it will package it in a nice, pretty little package for JSON. The next one that we see is this session interceptor. Let's just go out on a limb and assume that session interceptor might be what's responsible for this. So real quickly, when we check session interceptor, we know for a fact, based on the way the system is uh, designed, we could go look at base interceptor. So base interceptor has this intercept method. So understanding the way interceptors work is going to be crucial to understanding how to exploit this. And this works on struts, this works on spring, any struts derivative. In our particular case, you'll notice that our base interceptor does just a couple minor things. Now this can actually be gotten rid of. These aren't really doing anything in particular. And the same, honestly, is true with this. We probably in the future will have it a little tighter. The reason why we had this initially, these three lines here was for debugging purposes. So the thing of importance is right here in this SVJ intercept. So what that means is that every thing that extends base interceptor ultimately has to have this S 
VJA interceptor. And that's what's going to be called right out of the bat with all of these interceptors. So this method is the driver, all right? So what we see is this immediate grabbing of the invocation context. We see grabbing of the session map. And then we see putting that client info if missing into the session map, as well as a few other quick actions. And of course, we have this verify session here. We notice, importantly, that we see a call to action dot session ID, but we don't see a call to set it. But we can make the assumption that more likely than not, it's inside of git session from storage. Looking at git session from storage, we see real quickly again our context. We see the request. This is very much what we had before. The next thing we wind up seeing is this conversion. So we convert the action immediately into a base action. Presumably everything inside this application is going to extend, every action inside of this application is going to extend base action. A real quick reminder, actions are the actual things that we're calling here. You'll also hear them called uh, endpoints and things of that nature. So each one of these action classes should in fact extend base action. What we do is we verify that in fact the conversion worked and then we grab our and set inside of that action, the request and the response. And there are a variety of reasons why we do that. It's very common, but that allows us to change, for example, the response codes and other information. You'll see us rather quickly go through and set that session ID here. And we're setting our session ID based off what is coming out of the action. So the presumption is something's filling that in. If the session ID is present, the next thing we do is we grab the session from the actual database. What we wind up doing from there, of course, is if the database returned an actual sessions record, one that's not empty, we're able to move forward and you see us perform a couple of checks. So if present for an authentication action, we change our session ID. This is called rekeying. The reason why you rekey is to prevent session fixation. Session fixation is where I go through and I create a session and I stuff that session and I'm going to stuff it with whatever, or maybe I don't stuff it. Maybe I just create it and I sit on it, but I need to have some means of getting that session ID over to you. Now, the beautiful part to all of this is we know exactly how we can set the session ID. We can set the session ID inside the action via deserialization, and that is key here. So via a deserialization attack, either through struts or through the struts JSON plugin in this particular case, I'm just going to set the actions session ID or I can. And if I do that, then it will read that it already has a session ID and we will make it all the way down the stack without any problems. Now, importantly, as we move on, you see if that session doesn't in fact exist, then it's going to instead scream that you've specified an unknown session. We do a couple other things. And the real question is, when does that actions session map get set? We see here the action session record gets set, but when does the action session map get set? So as we move forward, we see here this grabbing of that session ID. We see verification of the session data. The next thing we do is see setting that session map. Now this is in the context. So that's for that greater application. The context itself is a struts construct. All verify session does is call verify client. Verify client is going to verify the client information here. So the whole point and purpose of this is to prevent session hijacking, or at least prevent some form of it. Nicely, we do this as a global level via these session interceptors. So the big thing is we have to understand that in order to 
trick the system into thinking that we have authenticated based on this data there are a few different pieces of information that we can do. So first and foremost, we recognize session ID needs to be set in some way, shape or form. If session ID is not set, then it's going to go off and it will fall through here and change the session ID on us. So it'll create a new one. If session ID is set, the next thing we have to recognize is that that session must exist inside the database. The reason why it has to exist inside the database is because while I'm able to change a lot of things, what we do here is a check to see if the session is there from the database. And then if that session is not there, so this will come back empty, then it's going to ultimately scream and throw an unknown session exception. If however, the session does in fact exist, then it checks to see if the session is expired. If the session is expired, it throws the timeout exception. If the session is not expired, then it moves on and everything is good. So we have a few different important pieces of data that we need to manipulate. And I'm going to show you first and foremost, a really fun one. So hopefully you remember I mentioned that we have an important concept here. This thing talks about the sessions record. I can actually manipulate the sessions record right from the get go. And since I'm able to manipulate the sessions record, everything else becomes moot. So we can remove our authentication component, which is right there. And we see here we have sessions record and we have an ID, and then we have session data. So I'm going to fluff this ID up a little bit just for fun. This is our session map, our intended session map. Now we're getting an illegal parameter exception. This is coming from our application itself. So if we take a real quick peek at the logs, just so we understand what's going on, you'll see the user is empty for some reason. So We've moved this far and we can actually plug the stack into here. What that means is we've moved far enough that we're actually making it into that authentication phase. So the question is whether or not our session record has been created. So let's take a real quick peek. So looking at this, you'll see we actually managed to inject our session into here. And you might ask yourself, how did the session get written? And the real key here is, I don't care that I was unable to authenticate. It actually makes no difference to me. What I care about is that I'm able to create a record. Now, this session record was created by our session writer. The session writer occurs, if you remember, as one of the last steps in this. So looking at our stack here, we have the session writer. This is going to happen no matter what, whether we fail or not, this gets kicked off. As a result, I do not care that my user was unauthenticated. It doesn't make a bit of difference to me. What I care about is the fact that I'm able to create sessions at will. So looking at this particular piece here, we're going to see that we add this, it's called a pre-result listener. And that means it's going to fire off before a result goes flying up and out of the stack. This guy here has this before result. And what this does is very simply try to write that session to the database. So looking at this real quickly, we have a nice easy pathway. The first thing it does is it checks to see if this session record is empty. If the session record is empty, then it's going to just ignore everything else. It's as though nothing happened at all. And ultimately nothing will get written to the database. We will see an exception log saying that it couldn't find the session to be saved. And that's it. The next thing we notice is if the session record isn't empty and we created a session record, that's the important thing here. We've created this sessions record object. We gave it an ID and we gave it session data. It goes through and it grabs that data and it grabs this session map here. 
that we're setting. And what it does is it compares the pieces of data. And then it does one of two things. Either one, it creates a new session and pumps in that last accessed data, or two, it saves it. What decides this is whether or not this session data matches. If the session data doesn't match, then it's going to overwrite what it sees inside that session record. And it's going to overwrite it with the data from our session map. So what this winds up doing for us as an attacker is it gives us a valid token that we can start using. You will note that we create this ID here. And if we plug that token here into our cookie data and hit send, we authenticated. You'll notice I didn't actually authenticate. There was no username and password put into here. What I did was I put my user as the administrator inside my session map, and then I set my actual session data here. And that all gets, of course, written into our session. Now, you may recall We've talked before about some of these things in the past. We have an option here. So we have just done a complete and utter authentication bypass. Now, the way we did this was by injecting our own session with our own session data. And we can actually keep stuffing our session and our session data if we so choose. The problem, of course, with doing that is it makes it so that if we have so you notice now with this session id set such as we have it set we're getting a 500. so real quickly just taking a peek we could see what's going on here our 500 is being caused by an insertion into the session because of course session data winds up being null whereas now this works. So this is a different way of doing our authentication bypass. We can do something like this. So you notice how it's requesting us to go through and authenticate. So we're going to go back to our original. So we have two main methods of doing our bypass. Importantly here, you'll see this why, so on and so forth, has no data inside of it. The reason why it has no data is because when we wrote our malicious session, we were writing to the session we had created. So this has our malicious data inside of our fake ID, but this is empty. It doesn't matter that it winds up being empty because of how and when everything gets written. So we have this user ID, an invalid user ID, but we have sessions record set, so it's not returning null. So something really neat and important is let's talk about how struts works from a collection management aspect. So as you might remember from our last one, struts goes through and it fills everything in based on what it sees here. So if we have something like a collection, then it's going to create a collection. We can, as you might remember, create our own objects based on this. Now, so what I didn't show you before was an interesting way that struts winds up working with maps and collections. So as far as collections are concerned, it actually creates an array list. And you'll notice how many empty entries. I'll tell you right off the bat, there are literally 1000 empty entries and only one, the last one, will actually have any data in it and it sits down here. 
That is our 1001st entry. What that means is from an attacker perspective, it's actually very easy to create a large amount of resources and then consume them. Now you may remember we have our session map sitting in here. Now, unfortunately maps work the same way, but it's a little different as far as the attack is concerned. And one of the easiest ways to actually perform this attack is really against either an array or against a collection. So when we're working with maps, it's a little harder because for a map, of course, in Java, I don't necessarily specify the index. The way Java winds up working for something like this, maps just simply don't have that concept. But these collections and arrays do. So I wanted to give you these minor tidbits so that you could play with them. And just to emphasize the point, I will point out that session record, of course, sits in base action. And session record is a default juke generated object. The problem isn't with the class. It's not with this VO. The problem is actually with struts and the JSON plugin. From an attacker's perspective, it doesn't matter what that class is because of the way struts winds up working. So I, of course, as an attacker can go through and use near arbitrary methods. So let's take a real quick look at the JSON populator. This of course only applies to the JSON side of things, but it is really interesting to look at. So the JSON populator itself is what is responsible for taking any of our JSON data, such as this, and then actually populating the different, they're called Java beans. So the different instances of each one of these classes. Something really quickly that you should notice is this annotation for JSON. So if we look at this, you'll see the default here is that an item is both serializable and deserializable. That default, unfortunately, is what gets us into all of this trouble. By having a default of both, which is very common, it makes it so that I can serialize and deserialize items I shouldn't and that I shouldn't be able to. And that's what you see on this side of the attack. Now, on the other side of the house, the reason why you see some of this excessive information is slightly different because we've actually used, we don't use the JSON plugin for writing necessarily. We've augmented it, not for the serialization side of the house. We actually use our own, and that one uses our own annotation, which doesn't suffer the same issue. But what you'll notice is a major design problem on either side of the house. By making your serialization and deserialization depend solely upon annotations, what you are in fact doing, as we can see here, where we have annotations for our gets, this JSON property tells it that it can output if that item isn't null. The issue is it's recursive. So we see here it recurses and gives us information that we may want in certain contexts, but not in others. A base user, for example, doesn't need to know that the user is admin. That functionality would be useful for someone inside of an administrative console, but not for someone here. In fact, the base user doesn't even necessarily need to know the modified by information. They would want to know the modified date and they might want to know the modified user's first or last name if we had contact data in a system like this. But that's about it. They don't need this other data. When you are working with anything that uses annotations, and it doesn't matter, or the equivalent, anything that would do this recursive serialization or deserialization, and that's, again, 
struts, of course, and as a result, spring and things like that. But it's also other systems like PHP, Perl, Python, and of course, C Sharp. They all suffer the same issue. You need to be very careful about the relationships between these classes to prevent automatic recursive serialization and deserialization vulnerabilities. So this aside with its defaults of true, what we see is the JSON populator goes through and it will serialize and deserialize anything that's public. Now, it does have some minor constraints here and there, but for the most part, it's, it's actually rather simplistic. And you'll see we will serialize and deserialize primitives. We will handle nulls, of course. Nulls just come out as nulls. We will handle maps, collections, arrays. We will handle big decimals, and we will handle integers. Now you might ask what a primitive is, and just real quickly, so your primitives are of course shorts, bytes, longs, integers, floats, doubles, booleans, anything that's a number, so on and so forth. And of course we do things like string, which you see here. Additionally, we do simple dates. And you'll notice they're using that simple date formatter, which by the way is not a great idea but it does dates as well. There are a couple other odd pieces here and there, but that's the general gist of thing. So as an attacker, the thing to keep in mind is you may not necessarily know everything about a system, but usually you can find most of this stuff through trial and error. If you have access to source code, however, you don't have to guess names anymore. This becomes much easier. Even if you don't have access to the source code, if you have the UML diagram, for example, that will more likely than not give you the information you need. And from there, the system will go through and if it sees a setter method or a class variable or other such variable that is public, it will call to it and you as an attacker can set but you can also read if you know what you're doing. So remember, we have a lot of options here. It's also interesting to note that Struts a few years ago, in 2017, Struts had a whole slew of vulnerabilities. And I've mentioned before, they've struggled to fix them and they have yet to. Something that came out of that is this acceptable parameter name. So interestingly enough, even though Struts has this fancy acceptable parameter name component, it gets ignored by the struts JSON plugin, allowing me as an attacker to go through and set the session data despite being explicitly called out in here, which just goes to show one of the absolutely positively most important things about all of this, which is that you complicate things tremendously as you add in additional plugins. There's a lot of trust involved, and sometimes that trust simply isn't warranted. So I hope you all enjoyed this. It's an interesting example of a very common attack vector that hardly anyone ever talks about or goes over. We're also able to see a really interesting thing about serialization, deserialization, but honestly, most input validation attacks. And that is that very rarely does the end result matter. What matters to me, the attacker, is what happens in between. So looking at this, we see our malicious ID has been entered. And now, if we send this, we have our nice new account. Complete with all of this information. Even though according to the response, the attack failed, we see that it worked perfectly fine. I want to thank you all for watching and have a great day. Um, and again, uh, to the next episode, please subscribe to the Ranyo and Duran podcast show, and we'll see you then. Thank you. I'm Ranyo. I am Duran. Have a good one. Have fun. <laughs>